Hello, everyone. So uh, welcome again to our BioCaddy uh, external webinar. Uh, in today's presentation, we're going to have Dr. Peter Murray Rust. He's a, a chemist currently working as a reader in the molecular informatics at the University of Cambridge, and he's also a senior research fellow of Churchill College, Cambridge. Uh, after obtaining uh, his PhD, he became a lecturer in chemistry at the University of Stirling and was first warden of Andrew Stewart Hall of Residence. Uh, in 1982, he moved to Glaxo Group Research at Greenford uh, to head the molecular graphics, computational chemistry, and later protein structure determination. He was also a professor of uh, pharmacy in the University of Nottingham from 1996 to 2000, setting up the Virtual School of Molecular Sciences. Uh, so in today's presentation, Dr. Murray Russ will talk about Content Mind Project, which uses machines to liberate 100 million facts from the scientific literature. Uh, so please welcome Dr. Murray Russ. Well, thank you very much indeed. This is a wonderful opportunity. Um, and um, uh, just to say that um, I'm in Cambridge in the make space uh, here, so there may be people coming in and out, um, occasional doors banging, but um, I think you can hear me okay, right? Um, and um, I'm going to uh, show about 35 slides, about one a minute, um, and I'm very much looking forward to discussion and ideas and possibly people who want to get involved. So um, let's go on to slide three. Um, uh, make sure that I can use the apparatus. Uh, so um, this, is, um, uh, this is our overview. Um, just to say that um, uh, everything I say is open under CC BY. Um, you can take it, use it for whatever, and the audio recording will also be the same, and this is uh, really exciting. So um, one of the things which I promote, I'm not going to talk much about today, is being open. <laughs> Uh, just to say um, that I'm heavily involved in the Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, which um, uh, describes and liberates knowledge in the digital age. And uh, for the last year, I've been a Shuttleworth Fellow. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth developed the Ubuntu system and put uh, a lot of the money he made into a charitable foundation uh, to support fellows. Um, and, and I'm one of them at the moment, and it's given me an opportunity to develop this. So after the introduction, um, the theme here is that there's a huge amount of scientific data. Um, we have perhaps between two and 5,000 papers published every day, um, and nobody can keep up with it, uh, with the result that we're not reading um, the stuff which is important to us because there's too much and also because it's very difficult to find in many cases. So um, there are lots of places where information occurs, articles, theses, reports, patents, uh, and lab books. And um, what I'm going to present here is an open project. Anybody can join, and if any of you feel inspired, we'd be delighted to, um, uh, to hear from you. Um, and just to check, I think Amy Price, one of the attendees, uh, is already heavily involved uh, with us in um, clinical trials, unless it's a different Amy Price. So um, uh, we're building all our stuff openly. Again, if you like hacking, there's lots of opportunities for hacking. So this is to show how important it is. This came out about a month ago. The um, uh, uh, Liberian uh, Ministry of Health discovered that 30 years ago there was a paper uh, which indicated that Liberia should be included as an Ebola virus endemic zone. Now, what they said is that if they had known about this two or three years ago, then they might have been able to take precautions to avert the epidemic, which has killed several thousand people in uh, West Africa. That paper uh, was hidden. Um, it's not easy to find, but uh, using our technology, um, it would be straightforward to find papers which contain the word Liberia, uh, and contain the word Ebola, 
um, and that would alert people at least to read this paper. So that's an example of the sort of simple thing uh, that uh, we can do with our technology. So um, this is the scale of the um, uh, problem. Um, research worldwide, publicly funded research, is about um, half a trillion dollars. Um, and um, over a million articles a year come out of it. So a huge amount of research money goes into it. Um, and um, the problem is that the way we publish it at the moment uh, may serve some purposes, but it's actually a very poor way of communicating research. Um, and at the bottom line there, you can see that um, this, is not, this is a figure from the Lancet three years ago that 85% of research is wasted because it's not published at all, it's badly conceived, it's duplicated, it's poorly published or whatever. So we're losing a vast amount of the work that we put in um, and that means that the science is poorer than it could be and uh, also, unfortunately, that people are dying because they don't have um, the information available uh, to make an impact. So um, our project, funded by Shuttleworth, um, is to mine all the facts from the scientific literature. I've used a figure of 100 million. It may seem a lot, but actually we've already aggregated 4 million papers and as you'll see in a minute, um, a paper could contain many hundreds or thousands of facts. So actually, this is probably an underestimate. And the phrase at the bottom um, is a political one. I'm not going to be very political in this talk, uh, but um, there are many things which we're allowed to read, but uh, we haven't given much thought to the idea of using machines to read it on our behalf. So uh, we often have a technology problem that the information isn't in the right way. It's in PDFs, um, or even worse, it's um, uh, scanned from old papers and so on. But unfortunately, there's also a socio-political problem, which is that many publishers, particularly the large toll access publishers, actually forbid us to use machines to read the literature unless uh, we ask special permission and usually pay additional money to do it. Now, we believe that the right to read is the right to mine. Anything that a human eye can do, a machine should be able to do. And our technology um, does uh, exactly that. So here's an example showing that science is actually applicable to everybody. It's a little um, uh, exercise that we do with um, new people. We give them papers from the literature. Uh, and this has been marked up with um, highlighter marker by people who are not scientists. But you can actually see that um, you know, a reasonably read adult and often uh, uh, school children as well uh, can go through and make a pretty good job of identifying where the information is. They might not understand every word, such as monophyletic, but given, you know, our uh, online tools such as Wikipedia and the biological databases, it's actually quite easy to resolve that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, we take this forward very much as a human-machine uh, combination. So, we're doing this at the moment by running workshops. Um, we develop software and we try out all our software in workshops so that uh, people um, uh, get a feel for it and we get immediate feedback as to what needs to be done to make it work. So our idea is you should be able to distribute the software and install it um, in less than an hour. Um, we use a virtual machine, so it takes little time to download the virtual machine, but that you can get started very quickly and that you can build a simple mining application within a morning. And that's the important thing. We do the hard and dirty work uh, so that you can start doing um, the more exciting scientific stuff without worrying about the formats of files or the configuration of the machines. So some more examples here. 
Um, and at the bottom is um, Jamie Malloy, um, who's actually next door um, uh, in another meeting here. Uh, but um, Jenny has done a lot to take this forward, and um, uh, you can see her at the top right. Um, she must be there somewhere. There's Jenny, yes. Um, uh, running a workshop for her, um, late last year in New Delhi. So we've taken this across the world, and we found that people understand what it's about pretty quickly. So, next slide. Um, this is some more of our team. I won't dwell on that, but most of them are early career researchers, um, students, graduate students, and so they're very much involved with um, how it works. And we've got more of our team uh, since then. Um, some of the workshops we've run, I'm not going to go through them, uh, but a range of funders, publishers, um, uh, political groups, um, and so forth. Now, there's one um, bit of uh, legal politics we have to deal with, um, that your subscription to journals might be overruled by something that your library has signed which says that you can't do content mining. Um, by the way, uh, there's another phrase often used is TDM, text data mining. But we use content mining to show that it's uh, images, uh, diagrams, audio, as well as just that. So in the UK, we fought very hard. And last year, we got the right to um, use machines to mine publications uh, regardless of what the publishers put in their contracts. Um, it does make it difficult for those of you in other countries possibly. Uh, you should talk to your libraries and find out what you can do. But in the last resort, if you want to do uh, research along the lines I'm going to suggest, uh, then come over to Cambridge UK and we can do it all together. It's a very political area in Europe at the moment. But let's get on to the technology. So here's an example of content. Um, it's a paper from um, uh, PLOS One. Um, and as you can see, it's got a lot of different types of information. Uh, on the right-hand side, it's got text. Uh, and one of the things we do is we add sections to the text so that you can search for things in just a particular bit of text, uh, which is, let's say, the um, methods or the author contribution, so you know who's doing what or whatever. Uh, and that sort of thing uh, we have no difficulty in analyzing. Uh, on the left is a diagram. And you might think that machines can't understand diagrams, but we put a lot of work into analyzing um, uh, particularly monochrome diagrams, black and white ones, but also ones with simple color. And we can actually understand uh, most of the science in that diagram, which consists of molecules. We've put a lot of work into doing molecules, and we'll see this later, um, and uh, also into understanding XY plots, of which, uh, in this case, a gas chromatograph uh, is one. Mathematics is difficult. Um, we've done a bit of work on mathematics. Um, we've done a very small amount of work on maps. Uh, and we've done quite a lot of work on tables. So uh, we're aiming uh, to make all of this um, straightforward for most of the scientific literature. So here's an example of um, an automatic uh, program uh, which goes through a piece of um, uh, science. And what we're doing here is we are marking up uh, what are called named entities. Um, so you can see here that the word Namlex uh, is uh, a defined proper noun. It's actually an atmospheric chemistry program. Uh, Macehead is a place in Ireland uh, um, off the west coast of the UK. Um, ethanol is a chemical compound and so forth. So an awful lot of science looks like this where we're picking out uh, nuggets from a piece of uh, science. Uh, here's one which we're working with neuroscientists um, in Edinburgh. I'm going up there the week after next. Um, and 
they're using these for um, uh, clinical um, neuroscience. So here you can see in the diagram, diagram B, that various drugs, uh, oxaliplatin, amitriptyline, have been administered in this case to rats, but it might be to humans, over a period of days, and various um, uh, biological responses have been uh, measured. Now, um, Emily, who works in Edinburgh, uh, has to digitize this because the numbers in it are valuable and it takes her about half a day to pull the numbers out of this using um, you know a mouse and pointer and measuring things and typing things in uh, for some of the diagrams not yet this one but we hope to do it in two weeks uh, we believe we can get an answer out in a second that the machine can understand uh, this it can understand the words written on each of the um, axes. Uh, it can understand the numbers on the axes. Uh, and we have an algorithm for finding out where the straight lines are. So we believe that um, most of you will be dealing with graphs of some sort. We call these XY plots or bar plots. Uh, and that once we've solved one, then we believe we've so solved several million, because there are probably at least 10 million uh, diagrams like uh, this in the literature um, every year. So this diagram tells you how we go about it. Now there is a boring bit which is crawling, scraping and normalizing. And you don't want to do this if you can help it. And we've automated uh, much of this so that um, uh, we can do it for you. And that then brings us uh, to be able to present you with what we call open semantic science. Uh, it's science, it's open, um, and um, all of the terms, where possible, have been marked up uh, to be um, semantically meaningful. So uh, where you have names, they're referenced through to, say, Wikipedia, um, or to the biological databases like GenBank um, or Wikidata. Uh, so that when we've got this, we hope to uh, pull this out every day, uh, then um, you can um, either use our tools to mine it, or you can develop your own tools. And uh, for some of them, uh, it could be as little as a day to write a tool. Some of them, of course, uh, may take a year or two. Our chemistry tools took a lot of um, writing, but many of the data analysis tools will be quite easy to work. Uh, and so we mine it. Our tool for mining it is called Amy, and it works on a plug-in basis. And we put the results in something called the catalogs on a daily basis. So the metaphor uh, is a stream of facts coming out every day. We're not going to build a um, complete database of all the facts. Um, and because they're open, anybody can do it. We're going to root some of them into Wikidata, which I think is a really exciting development and one of the most um, uh, valuable repositories of um, scientific and other data. But um, if you want to capture your own particular subject, and I hope we can talk about this uh, in a minute, uh, then um, you'll be able to capture it on a daily basis and put it into uh, a database. We'll be keeping the metadata in the database and some of the most important facts. So moving on, um, this is the architecture diagram. Uh, it looks complicated because actually uh, scientific information is messy. So we have a stage at the left hand side for crawling. Um, we can either crawl automatically and we do that by getting um, feeds from things like journal talks, uh, crossref, ref um, core repository, and so on. And the result of that is a set of URLs or DOIs uh, relating to scientific papers. We then put them into Quickscrape, written by Richard Smith Unner. And Quickscrape has a per journal scraper. These scrapers um, are now quite quick to write uh, with a tractable journal, 
you can write one in half an hour. And of course, it's not one per journal, it's often one per publisher. So when you've written one scraper for BMC, you've actually got it for all the BMC journals. Similarly, some papers are um, uh, done in the high wire format. And we found yesterday, Ross Mounts was able to write a scraper for the International Journal of Systematic and Evolutionary Microbiology um, in about half an hour. Now, Publishers vary according to what they put on their website. So when you scrape a website, you may get a PDF, an XML, an HTML. Sometimes it's good HTML. Sometimes more often it's awful. You may get CSV. You may get um, uh, documents, uh, doc files, um, a, a whole range of things. And we can take all of these and hold them in a carefully structured directory. Now the next one is one that you, is even less fun for you to do. It's turning this into semantic um, material. Because PDFs are not fun to read. Um, bad HTML is not fun. Some of the XML is arcane and so on. And what we do in Norma is on a per journal basis automatically um, turn it into structured semantic um, material. Usually um, HTML, we call that scholarly HTML, that's what the S is for, um, or alternatively SVG or whatever. And just today we have um, bolted in the Tesseract system which does optical character recognition uh, very nicely, and so we can come out with SVG uh, from the optical character recognition. And that's a major step forward. And then in the um, AMI uh, system, we have plugins. Um, a major technique uh, is regular expressions or XPath uh, or regex. Um, but we have bespoke uh, plugins for chemistry, phylogenetics, um, sequences and so on. So if you have an area you're interested in, uh, I would love to discuss how to write a plugin. And as I say, it can be between a day and um, a year depending on what, uh, uh, what domain specific computation you need to do. And also as a byproduct, we get a complete collection of normalized scientific literature. So you don't have to worry about what the publisher was or whatever. So long as it's open, we can turn it all into the same form of scholarly HTML, which is uh, really simply um, proper HTML, um, uh, W3C compliant, and, much, uh, and tagged up with a variety of tags. So on we go. Um, here is um, our strategy uh, for doing it. A daily crawl, we crawl the green ones. Um, sorry if you don't do red-green, I should have thought of that. Uh, on the left-hand side are uh, the open ones, um, and on the right-hand side are the closed ones. The right-hand ones we can turn in the bottom here into semantic articles. The, uh, closed ones, we can still extract the facts, and the facts go into our catalog system. Uh, there's an example of a repository where we get them from. So we can enhance this uh, crawling diagram uh, to show not only the daily crawl here, but for some journals we can go backwards. So for example, PLOS is very easy to get all the back ones because the first published paper was called number one, and the current set is about 120,000. So you can simply iterate over all the published PLOS papers with that. Other systems here have got table of contents, um, which allow you to iterate over the journal. And on the right-hand side, we've done patents. Uh, we've done a certain number of theses. And remember, theses are a big untapped area. Um, I would say that probably uh, most science ends up um, in a thesis somewhere or other. Not all the science, but there are um, copies of it and so forth. And um, there's a massive amount in theses which doesn't get published uh, later. So 
here's an example of the sort of uh, things we can find in our catalog. Um, this is searching by authors. This is an interactive system. I put the URL up there, but it's also uh, back on slide um, uh, 13, the one with the water pipe. Um, it's not yet um, uh, fully documented, but basically here's um, a graph that shows me as an author, the uh, yellow one, uh, sorry, the orange one in the middle, uh, and the pa some of the papers in there that I've written. These are the blue dots, and you can see some papers uh, where um, I've only got two other authors. Uh, this set of papers at the top, uh, there's 20 other authors, uh, which is a paper we published on the Blue Obelisk uh, chemical open software system. And this is a very easy thing to move around, uh, and you can try it yourself. Um, the next picture <coughs> shows uh, a similar uh, example, but here we're looking for science. So in this particular case, the um, uh, node in the middle there uh, called 63 is the phrase volatile composition of. These are uh, three, um, these are actually uh, three um, uh, plants uh, which uh, have volatiles, and you can see that they're linked by this phrase, uh, but you can also see the number of other papers which are uh, related uh, to these plants. And on the right-hand side is one paper uh, which uh, relates to both of these um, plants. So they're mentioned um, in the same paper. So you can get that visual display very, very quickly. Uh, and this can be used for any subject that you can extract facts from. So I'm not going to go in great detail here, uh, but we use simple tools um, rather than uh, machine learning, mainly because uh, they're actually quicker to get off the ground and because we want people to be involved, they find it much easier to understand things like bag of words uh, than they do some of the um, uh, machine uh, processing, uh, machine learning tools. I, we have written machine learning tools uh, such as for chemistry where they do extremely well, but it took um, uh, well over a year to develop uh, the tools, whereas uh, we think that humans can get started uh, on some of these um, in less than a day. Regular expressions are very, very powerful as are also templates, and here it's the skill of the people developing them uh, rather than trying to auto-generate them from the literature. And of course, lookup at the bottom is again very valuable, that uh, most of the important species, um, some, you know, probably a million species in Wikidata, so if we want to know whether something's a species, we can look it up. Um, here's bag of words. Um, which is you know, another example as word cloud. And here we've taken things from the French Howl repository. Um, and you can immediately see when we filtered out the non-discriminatory words, uh, then uh, you get uh, the top one tells you this is about protein structure at different temperature and pressure and molecular dynamics, whereas the bottom one is about um, anaerobic uh, dis digestion um, and so on. So the key words actually are often mentioned many times in a paper and they come out as a very strong signal. So uh, running over our two or three thousand papers a day, we can rapidly come up with bag of words and you can find those papers which map onto your bag of words. You can see the middle one is French, so we can do other uh, languages um, using the um, uh, ISO Latin character set. Um, we haven't done anything with um, CGK or non-European um, uh, languages. Now here's an example of the result. So we've got an algorithm for looking for species. Um, and if you look at uh, this, each hit for species is what's called a result. Um, and you can see that the match was Klebsiella pinomii. Um, and we also put the surrounding context. We've had to fight the publishers for this, but we're allowed 100 characters on either side, which is tremendously valuable in giving this. So here we want to know why it's talking about Krebsiella. 
analysis revealed that the genome of Krebsiella um, LM21 harbors eight chromosomal loci, uh, and so on. And uh, so immediately you've got an idea of why you found this term. Uh, and the next one will here in this page, uh, uh, in slide 27, um, is that not only do we get the um, hit, uh, but you also uh, can see the position in the document uh, where um, it's found. So this thing called XPath is a precise pointer to which paragraph um, it's been found in. And by using that pointer plus the surrounding pre and post um, or uh, prefix and suffix, uh, that precisely maps onto the W3C open annotation um, standard. So this can be used to annotate the um, original paper uh, automatically, um, uh, assuming that you have the right to do it. And my colleague, um, uh, Dan Whaley uh, in Shuttleworth, uh, has a project called Hypothesis, um, which is um, working on annotation. So um, it's straightforward to pull out um, uh, well-defined uh, terms. And um, we had a meeting in Oxford with the Cochrane um, collaboration on uh, developing tools to uh, see if we can identify a document as a cl clinical trial. Uh, it's not as simple as you might think. And um, one of the things they've got is a set of guidelines called consort, and that allows you, uh, us to build very precise and wide-ranging regular expressions and templates uh, to see if the information that they require in a clinical trial is present. Things like uh, p-values, things like number of patients, etc. Now, uh, regular expressions uh, go a long way, but if you want to go further, uh, then uh, you need a natural language processing for the language. Um, here's uh, the Chomskyan approach to um, parsing sentences. The cat sat on the mat, and this comes out as a tree with a sentence, noun phrase, verb phrase, preposition phrase, preposition, noun phrase. And there are many, many tools for doing that sort of thing, um, and we've applied it to chemistry. Now, I believe that this can be applied to many, many procedural forms of um, uh, scientific language, particularly um, synthesis, experimental procedure, analysis, um, and so forth, uh, use of equipment, uh, etc. So here we've got DMAP was dissolved in THF. Now, you don't need to know what THF or DMAP is, we can look that up. Uh, but you can see um, that um, this works out, there's a dissolve phrase. Um, uh, and uh, it works out that there's a quantity of material. And it works out uh, here that there's an amount of stuff um, and somewhere there should be a molecule. So all of that has been worked out. And there's no reason in my view why that can't be applied to neuroscience. Um, or to uh, behavioral science, molecular biology, or whatever. It's a question of feeding in the most likely phrase structure uh, and then using natural language processing uh, to get it out. Um, so here's a typical chemical synthesis. There's about 3 million of these published a year, or maybe more, probably 10 million at least, uh, like that. And uh, you can do this at home. You can see the um, uh, URL at the top. I'm not going to do it now because I don't want to break the system. But if you send that off in real time, it sends it off and within a few hundred milliseconds returns the result uh, from Cambridge. So not only has it parsed every uh, phrase in the sentence, it's essentially understood every word in the sentence because this is formulaic language, but it's also been able to work out the chemical structure from the name. So the only thing holding us back uh, from doing the whole chemical literature, and of course a lot of chemistry is found in the bioscience literature, is uh, the permissions to do it. Uh, we've done this on patents. Uh, so on one desktop, we did um, half a million 
uh, reactions in patents, um, and we got uh, something like 70% recall. Uh, so from that phrase up there, we've actually been able to work out uh, the precise chemistry and balance the reaction. Now, let's move on to um, images, uh, because a lot of science is stored as images. I'll differentiate here between bitmap images, which are um, pings, JPEGs, or um, TIFFs, or GIFs, uh, and uh, vector diagrams, uh, which are um, EPS uh, or SVG. Now, most of you will create your diagrams as EPS or SVG or similar, but unfortunately, the publication process very often reduces it to pixel maps, which is a tremendous pity. Um, if the thing is still present as um, vectors, uh, and that is true in most author manuscripts and most theses, but not in most publications, uh, vectors you can get out with very high um, precision and uh, very few errors. But we can do pretty well on images, um, pixel maps, and uh, here, um, we prototyped this yesterday, we've used a tool to called Tesseract, um, and when you, it's open source, of course, uh, and when you um, run Tesseract on um, uh, this diagram here, it pulls out, you can see with no errors, the y-axis values, it pulls out with no errors the y-axis label, and the same for the x-axis as well. And some diagrams have got um, legends inside. So we really are confident that for many diagrams, if they're in a normal font like um, uh, sans serif, Helvetica Arial, or um, sometimes Times Roman, which is a little bit more tricky, uh, we can pull out um, you know, all of the numeric data. Um, and then we move on to the actual uh, come on it should show my next slide is my next slide showing oh yes okay there's my next slide um, this happens to be an astrophysics journal uh, but don't worry about that it could equally well be a spectrum or chromatogram and uh, this was um, a uh, PDF which actually has vectors in it. Um, you can tell by magnifying. If you just get the PDF and magnify it up, you can get it. So this um, thing here is actually 2,000 data points in the PDF. Um, and uh, what we were able to do is to um, automatically... Next slide... Yeah, here, uh, extract that uh, curve into a CSV that's completely computable. So, for example, just to show you, we were able to smooth that curve um, uh, by standard methods and also calculate the second derivative. So, uh, that means that, in principle, um, if we have uh, diagrams, we can extract uh, tables out of that or other objects. We can do chemistry, so um, uh, we can uh, extract um, chemicals from um, uh, chemical diagrams. A um, new uh, tool we've got, which is currently called OSMIA, Open Source Molecular um, Image Analysis, um, and so forth. But to show you a biological example, uh, here is um, a... Um, uh, here's a um, phylogenetic tree. Now, this, these trees cost a lot of effort to create. Um, uh, if they're done well, you have to run them on a cluster. If you're uh, looking for precise um, uh, metrics as to how good it is, uh, represented here by the branch weights, 0.77 and so on, um, then uh, you have to run for many hours on uh, quite a you know, reasonable number of machines. Um, none, of the, none of these trees is actually published in machine-readable form. That's not quite true. About 4% are published in something called tree branch. But most of them 
are uh, simply only published as diagrams. And that's a terrible waste because we know of people who go to the literature with their ruler and try and measure this. So we've written a tool which will actually understand this. Uh, it will work out the um, uh, species at the right-hand side. Uh, it will work out uh, the structure of the tree and also measure the lengths of uh, the tree branches. And um, we don't just need um, uh, rectilinear ones like this. Uh, this is, next one should be um, uh, a circular diagram. So here's a tree um, in what's now a rather trendy way of showing it. Uh, there's the root of the tree. These are all the nodes of the tree. Uh, and this is a phylogenetic analysis of HIV isolates. Um, I think the um, uh, CA, I think, for, stands for Canada, and LA, I think, for Los Angeles. I'm not sure. But um, that was a pixel diagram. We can take that. Um, we carry out something called thinning um, and turn it into a set of connected pixels. Uh, we then do some graph analysis on it. And here um, at the bottom left, you can see the connected graph. And then we can transform it into something called NUIC format, which is the formal uh, representation of um, uh, a tree. Um, and that tree has been redrawn because we've turned it into a semantic form. We put it into a different program and redrawn it uh, you know, for uh, examples which like a horizontal uh, layout. So I'm coming to the last two or three slides. Um, this, uh, here are some things we can't do. We can't do handwriting. Um, scan diagrams are much uh, worse than born digital diagrams, much worse. Old documents, even if they're, uh, you know, even if you get tiffs of them, um, then uh, they can be a lot more problematic and so on. So generally, the quality of uh, diagrams has in improved. Tables, unfortunately, are a problem. A lot of people have worked on tables, and we can do some tables and so on. Um, if you have XML, and many publishers publish their XML and want you to use it, then it's much, much better than Word, and Word is much better than PDF. So um, if you can get into a repository and read the theses in Word, uh, you'll get a lot more science out than trying to hack the PDF. Um, some examples I've just put. Uh, one of the things that we intend to do is to index the whole literature. So uh, let's say that we have a vector of perhaps, um, I don't know, a thousand different fact types that you can get from a paper. Uh, and then you've got, uh, let's say, 2,000 um, uh, uh, papers a day. That's 2 million facts a day. Um, and those um, indexes could be things like, uh, does it have a chemical? What type of chemical it is? Does it have a species? Species and chemicals are a very high uh, precision uh, and uh, also very uh, good recall. So we, we build our um, index, the CAT, uh, and again, anybody can um, use this for uh, searching um, the literature. Remember that we will be doing this on a daily basis uh, in the first instance, and then by popular demand, we'll be looking at um, uh, retrospective. Um, very valuable for um, extracting facts. So the chemicals we get out, we could calculate their molecular properties um, uh, or you know, their pharmacophores or whatever. Um, uh, and then there are a lot of other things like um, uh, it's valuable uh, within your own research to be able to do this because you can say search the theses of the people in your own laboratory and find out whether anybody um, ha has done this before. And you may not believe this, but I talked to one very famous chemist at Cambridge uh, and he said that 25% of the work done in his laboratory duplicated work which had been done in the same laboratory, but they hadn't been able to check. So repetition uh, is often a terrible waste of, of time. And 
um, things like checking data at a very early stage uh, of the process. So just to uh, reiterate, um, this is uh, something which is a very human activity. Uh, we are very happy to do workshops for you, um, to come and travel. Uh, you know, we've got to recoup our costs, but uh, you know, it's um, uh, uh, you know, we're not making a profit out of this. We're plowing it back uh, into the project. Um, otherwise. Uh, we run um, uh, web sessions like this and so on. And you are, of course, uh, always uh, very um, welcome to come and uh, uh, join us in Cambridge. So the last slide uh, simply reiterates our URL. Um, if anybody's got ideas of subjects they want to work on, then this would be a wonderful time to discuss it. And uh, we work very much by setting up sub-communities um, so Amy's um, uh, running the clinical trials sub-community. Um, we're going to have them in plants, probably neuroscience, um, uh, crystallography, etc., etc. So I'll finish there, um, leave my microphone on, and let the chairperson take over. Okay, so... The conference uh, has been unmuted. So we're unmuted online, so now it's open for questions. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi. This is Amy Price. Um, hi, Amy. Hi. Uh, just interesting presentation, and I slides about Liberia, and yes. I'm wondering if um, it would be useful to connect with evidence who who uh, provides the literature for disasters. I think it really would, and. Um, if people can think of the things they want to search for, uh, we would love to do a daily crawl. So the obvious things we can do is places and uh, diseases by name. Um, they're unlikely to have ICD numbers in uh, most um, uh, uh, in most papers, I think. But a name disease uh, will be relatively straightforward, I think, to search for. So um, uh, that would be wonderful. Similarly, uh, anything to do with um, countries where there is, where there are, say, threats to biodiversity through natural disasters or something like that, um, uh, should also be straightforward to index. And uh, we don't just have to do the scientific literature, uh, the um, peer-reviewed literature. Uh, we can do reports. So we are. Um, interested in um, uh, who was it we were talking to um, uh, uh, I've forgotten but we're talking to WHO about indexing their reports and even uh, World Bank and so on thank okay. you thank you hello this, this hello? is Marshu from uh, UT Health uh, very interesting work this is really tremendous work I have one question about the uh, hardware infrastructure to support this kind of large-scale crawling, analyzing uh, a huge amount of uh, data. What kind of like a hardware infrastructure is needed? That's a very good question, and we don't uh, completely know yet. The actual daily crawling and indexing is not machine intensive um, because if we crawl uh, 2,000 papers, that's roughly one per minute. Um, and um, many of these um, uh, indexes take a few hundred milliseconds. So, you know, we can search for all the species in the literature uh, probably um, in a few minutes a day, something like that. Uh, so the actual production of the catalog and the index uh, we don't think is going to be massively um, uh, computationally intensive. Um, however, searching it, um, uh, we've built our stuff on Elasticsearch, um, and um, this is all done by Mark McGillivray in Edinburgh at Cot Cottage Labs. And there are really two strategies. One is to build up 
a central resource of infrastructure uh, and the other is to um, make distributable systems. Since everything is open source, it may be more efficient uh, for you to um, uh, take this and set this up locally. The main problem we face in all of this distribution at the moment um, is um, the intellectual property rights of the papers that we index. So for the open access ones, there isn't a problem. For the closed access ones, we obviously can't redistribute those papers um, because they come through subscription at the um, uh, University Library of Cambridge. Thanks. Uh, another question. Uh, did you do any kind of citation analysis? Do you create any like citation databases through this uh, process? So we produce the raw material uh, that would do this, but we don't actually uh, curate the database itself. Um, so we can produce citations every day. Um, so that would mean that we would come out with, um, uh, let's say, 2,000 papers um, at times, let us say, 50 uh, citations. Uh, so that's 100,000 citations a day. <clears throat> so this is um, not a big deal um, in terms of material. And if you are interested in citation um, analysis, uh, then you could um, uh, consume these citations every day um, and use them. We don't believe that citations are copyright protected um, and um, uh, in any case they're ephemeral. So we don't, one of the reasons we don't preserve things for more than a day or so is actually then that we don't have to do takedowns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah, hello. This is hello. Uh, calling in. Um, I was just wondering, I tried to go to the content line website and try to see uh, to use your API right now. And I was just curious for someone who wants to start using the program, what's the best way for us to get set up? Uh, the best way is to mail us at um, uh, the Content Mind community website, and uh, uh, because w um, the um, interface is being uh, literally re-engineered next week, uh, and it's probably more efficient for you to tell us uh, what you'd like to do, um, and um, you know we'll be able to give pointers and get you up to, uh, to speed. Uh, fairly rapidly. Um, of course, that means discussing your, uh, uh, you know, your general area of work. If you want to be um, confidential, then you may, um, uh, you know, need to uh, install things yourself. But we would be delighted to get, um, uh, you know, um, new collaborators on board, which is the best way of doing things. Thank you. We have another question uh, in a chat box from Mary Mangan. So it's right. about audio content, like webinars. Is anyone cataloging those? Hello, Mary. Is someone going to read Mary's question? Yes, so I'm going to read again. What about right. audio content, like webinars? Is anyone oh, so cataloging those? Uh, no, uh, we have no particular skills either in audio or in um, uh, or in video. Um, our reference to those was mainly that we're fighting for the political right for people to analyze it. Okay, any other questions for Dr. Moreres? Okay, so um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Peter Murray. Uh, just call me Peter. Um, and I said, just call me Peter. And if okay. anyone is interested um, offline, uh, we'd be delighted to know what subjects um, 
uh, you know, there are uh, that people are interested in. Okay, so thank you very much for your great presentation today. Uh, and uh, if anybody had any other questions later, I think uh, they can contact um, uh, Peter directly through yep. email. Um, so just one announcement for the next uh, external webinar. Uh, is going to be on June 11 from 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific time, and uh, where Dr. Carol Gobo is going to talk about the research objects. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay. Carol is great fun, so you'll enjoy that. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Bye, everybody, and thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.